Welcome to Asking for a Friend, everybody. This is an initiative by Never Not Creative, Young Bloods and Mentally Healthy that exists because we wanted to create a safe place for where you can ask the unaskable. So the questions that you're worried may change the way people treat you at work or affect the opportunities that might be given to you. We're bringing together industry leaders, mental health professionals to give non-judgmental responses in a safe, anonymous environment. Um, before I introduce our guests, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. So. I'd really encourage you to ask questions um, live in this session. You can do that in the questions tab over on the right-hand side. Um, some of you may have submitted questions beforehand, and we've actually got those that we'll be going through first. But please get your questions into the tab so we can get to those in the um, second half of the uh, session. You can also add any like links or things that you sort of agree with or find interesting in the chat as well. If you need more immediate um, help, and uh, I have added in a link here to um, Mentally Healthy, which has a whole bunch of chat li uh, um, lines you can call, not chat lines. <laughs> it's not that kind of help. A um, lot of lines that you can call, websites that you can visit. So worth going to check those out. Um, a caveat, everything that we do with Never Not Creative and Mentally Healthy is volunteer run and therefore essentially unofficial. We're a bunch of people using community to come together and tackle the challenges our industry is facing. So with that in mind, remember that with this being anonymous, um, we don't have the context for your questions. Everyone's situation is different. Hopefully the advice that you get is something to consider as you also then go and seek help either professionally or casually from other people. Um, so if things are getting very serious for you, please do go and seek professional help. With the housekeeping out of the way, I'm delighted to welcome Prue Jones. Prue, is this your third? Asking for a friend now. Is I, think it it might be. I think it might be your third, which is very mm. exciting. It's great to have Prue back. Thank Prue you. spent her 20 plus year career in creative leadership positions across the advertising, design, and digital industries and participated as a juror on multiple national and international design awards. Prue is an amazing leader and mentor for many who have had the luck to have worked with her. Uh, she's also a national board director of AGDA um, and Fjord's local inclusion and diversity lead. Thanks for coming back, Brew. I love being here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> we also have Jocelyn Brewer. So um, Jocelyn's with us uh, in voice. Uh, yes. We've had some a few technical issues this morning around cameras, um, but most important is that you get to hear the amazing advice that Jocelyn has. So Jocelyn is a psychologist and cyber psychology consultant. Um, her passion and expertise lies in the intersection of psychology, technology, and authentic well-being. After five years teaching social science, Jocelyn retrained as a psychologist. Um, and in late two 2013, she created Digital Nutrition, a framework for teaching principles of a healthy, sustainable relationship to technology. Instead of suggesting unplugging or digital detoxing, Jocelyn advocates for intentional and intelligent technology use. I don't know how uh, how that's going today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, can only... I think some of Mark Zuckerberg's cords that got disconnected the other day have been you know, permanently disconnected from my laptop for some reason. Yes. Well, um, it's one of those things where, yes, Facebook has had their issues. Oh, and then also okay. overnight, I think someone released the entire Twitch code base. Oh, um, fantastic. worth about $924 million, I think. Um, so thank you for joining us, Jocelyn. Um, we're really, really uh, happy to have you with us. Pleasure. Thank you. So, We'll get into it because actually there's some some of the questions have come in beforehand. We were just um, talking through earlier and there's some really, uh, really quite interesting topics to go through. Um, but Pro, I'm going to come to you first. So first question. I'm a female copywriter who's just joined a new agency team. I was so excited by the opportunity, but I'm fast realizing it's a bit of a boys club. I can already see briefs that I've been missing out on. I've been here for three months and there are meetings I can see happening in calendars that I'm not a part of. Any tips on forcing my way in? Mm, that old chess and I, huh? Um, yeah, I don't know about forcing my way in, but I I, I think, um, I mean, you can force your way in, obviously, but you can do it in a way that, that uh, you know, kind of sets the tone for your future interactions with the, the mm. department that you're in. Um, probably missing a little bit of context on this question. Like, I'd love to know how big the team was, but regardless, can answer answer to the best of my ability um 
also congratulations on joining that team. Um, that's that's really exciting. Um, yes, fast realizing it's a bit of a boys club. They are and tend to still be that way, right? I mean, we're not quite at the point where where things have, have turned enough anyway. Um, so I feel you. Um, but um, I'm kind of thinking, like, because you're saying the brief, you can see the briefs that you've been missing out on. I just want to give a little leadership perspective to this. Is that um, the way things are working? And I presume. You're, well, I'm presuming you're working in some kind of remote situation or at least a hybrid remote situation. Um, those briefs, you know, obviously um, leadership need to schedule the work. Whoever's, I don't, I don't know if you have a traffic manager in your creative agency or whoever's um, uh, responsible for resourcing, you may be finding that you're being slotted into um, what briefs are coming up and when they come up. That's just that's just an aside. Sometimes it's kind of easy to just kind of go, oh, I'm not getting any briefs and it must be for this reason. Honestly, sometimes it is um, it's it is just like keeping that flow of work going. Um, at least that's how things kind of work where I am as well. Um, but, um, yeah, I think that what you probably need to do is is have a meeting uh, with your your new CD, I'm assuming that that's who you would talk to, the person who's ultimately responsible unless you have like somebody, um, like a, a someone more senior to you that you can talk to. But definitely have that um, that chat with that person, you know, reiterate how excited you are to be there and that you can't wait to kind of get stuck in and bring value. God, I hate that. Um, whatever that means in the context of your agency, um, you know, award-winning, contribute, all that kind of stuff. Um, and you can kind of say, look, I've noticed that, you know, these, these briefs are uh, automatically or seem to be automatically going to um, other people um and uh, and i can see why you've you've selected me to work on the briefs that i'm on because of the experience and the expertise i bring with xyz um so you use the opportunity to kind of big yourself up at the same time but then you kind of just go i oh, look i'm like i really want to i really want to get my teeth stuck in um yeah and and just make make it really clear that the next time that opportunity comes up to work on something like the brief that you've seen going away um comes up you that you really love to be considered um and uh yeah the meetings that you um are not part of that always feels horrible like when you're excluded from a meeting and your first thought is oh my god I am being purposely excluded from this meeting nobody wants to hear what I have to say um that's often a wrong assumption um it's it's usually just um habit or you know uh you've been left off because you haven't traditionally been in those kinds of meetings before like um the best way around that is just to kind of say i'd really love to be involved in those meetings that that i can see going on because i really think i can bring something to that discussion blah 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 you get the gist now the important step here is that you follow up so after this has happened you put it in writing so you you use the opportunity to write to your cd and you thank them for taking the time to listen to you and and uh, about your you know where you want to take your career and the kinds of things that you want to be working on um and you know you you write that thank you saying i'm really looking forward again reiterating really looking forward to bringing my expertise and knowledge to these briefs um and but the, the thing here is that you create a paper trail right so that if you don't see any action you are able to then have another follow-up conversation and reference, you know, the, the previous meeting and that there is evidence that that meeting occurred and that and that your city probably, you know, replied to your email saying, great, I can't wait till you start working on this stuff as well. So that approach will stop anyone getting their nose out of joint because as soon, and I know this, as soon as you start asserting that there is gendered kind of stuff going on, regardless of whether it is true people get their noses out of joint mm -hmm. so you you know like uh i think that's probably the soft way to force yourself in but you know be yeah. assertive um and be positive and just you know again like focus on what you're bringing that's excellent advice thanks Prue. jocelyn anything to add there 
Yeah, look, I worked at Sydney Boys High for five years and was the only female in the staff room in social sciences. Wow, so I kind of know what that boys club feels like. And often it's just a little bit of playing into the boys club, I think. So, you know, faking interest in superannuation funds or football teams or whatever that might be like in order for people just to kind of get a bit more of a sense of you. Again, if you're working in a hybrid way, they might just not know you uh, in that and have a sense of you in that same kind of way and also totally agree with what Prue said around like not necessarily asserting it all being about gender because it could actually be a, a, about you know your particular interests or your skill set or different things like that so so without you know ignoring that being able to kind of put that to the side and assert all of those things um but also, like, just to so you, you do know that I can see those meetings being held that I'm not invited to. Um, that's not then an invitation to have secret meetings that aren't on the calendar, but just to kind of remind people how that might feel and how might that that might look to other people because that's like ostracism 101 really is, mm -hmm. is leaving people out. Um, there is a fantastic little um, uh, film, I think it's on Disney+, Plus, um, called Pearl, and it's about a ball of wool who's the female in the office of suits, and it's kind of wacky, but I would really recommend people have a look at that. It's like one of those short films, and it's about how Pearl, this little ball of wool, actually shapes herself into a very, like it's a madman kind of culture. And what happens then when the next female is employed and comes along and she's kind of really kind of, you know, manned up almost, and how she then notices how much she had to change. So I just give you that as a lovely little example that probably tells you I have a four-year-old and I watch a lot of Disney Plus. <laughs> That's cool. I think I found it. I'm going to pop it into the chat. Cool. Um, looks like it is. Is that the one? I think that's yeah, right. that is. Uh... <laughs> cool. Awesome. Um, okay. I guess the other thing to say is, is that, you know, it sucks that anyone should have to feel like that. Um, you know, it's, you, you hope that things are getting better. Um, and then you keep hearing stories like this. Um, and actually somebody else even just dropped into the, the questions that they also have that challenge. Someone I know as well, also um, on a on a Never Not Creative podcast recently, actually um, talked about a story of having to bring a slab of beer to a meeting um, mm. to be able to get into the boys club. So I guess the other thing that's worth looking at is just finding other women who are in your team or organization um, and try and get their view on, on how to tackle things like this as well. Um, so let's move to the next question uh, to you, Jocelyn. Mm -hmm. um, I've been enjoying remote working, but I've also been monitoring my screen time. We use different apps and tools for different clients and teams, and I've got notification overload. Everything is a response or a reply. It feels like I never get anything done. My wife says I'm getting snappy. It's probably all related, but I can't just turn everything off. What do I do? I swear this wasn't me asking this question, but it could have been. <laughs> this is a really, really common one. And yeah. often people do just say, oh, we'll wrangle your notifications. Well, you know, obviously that it, it's not that easy because we're trying to wade through tons of bits of information. And the AI on this stuff doesn't necessarily, that hasn't learnt which is important and what somebody posting a meme into the, the collaborative tool. Um, Ashley Willens is um, somebody who talks about time confetti and the idea that our time gets broken up by all of these notifications so there's that sense of not getting anything done and then the stress on our brains of literally cognitive overload of too much information um, and it's not being able to carve out time for deep work which is something that Cal Newport talks about um, if you're not familiar with Cal Newport's work he's got about four books um, uh, deep work, digital minimalism, and his most recent is a life with a world without email, which, um, you know, look, sounds a bit utopian, but his work is very, very interesting when it comes to talking about how broken some of these channels are, um, email especially, in terms of staying on top of things because um, they're not fit for purpose for, for many of our organisations. We're trying to fit into them rather than um, the, the tools being uh, created for exactly how we need to communicate. Um, so, you look, the, the, the answer here is really to, in, in teams, have a bit of an audit on communication strategies and set up more clear um, and kind of specific and reiterate um, policies or understandings really around communication and expectation over replies. 
Um, I don't think many of us have really understood, you know, I don't know how many people really ever got a lesson in how to use email. Like, does anyone know how to do, um, like, moving people to the BCC is a really fantastic way of kind of shaping conversations. We always have that person who's CC'd in who wants to jump in and you know, put in their two cents when they really just need to archive that email. Uh, it's not a chat function. Uh, and and being able to kind of know your body clock and know when your golden hours are, when you're going to get your best deep work done, it's probably two lots of 90 minutes a day, and being able to then kind of curate your team so people know when you're in that space. So um, it might be something simple if you're back in the office that you have a green hat, an orange hat, or a red hat on that signals to people how um, you can be interrupted, for instance. Mm. Uh, so it's it's really about, you need to communicate about how you want to communicate. And th so. That's such an interesting concept of like, do people even know how to use email? Because there's an assumption that everyone does, right? But the I know like if you're younger and entering the workforce, you probably haven't had to use email that much like everything's in you know teams or slack mm -hmm. or threads or forums or you know community-based stuff or whatsapp in fact yeah. mm -hmm. um and suddenly you get into work and you have to do email i'm trying to extract myself from email but people keep sending me them um, well it's a zombie that rises from the dead as soon yeah. as you send an email yeah you know yeah, yeah you get one back <laughs> and and you know the notion of in, uh, inbox zero is something that i've talked to a, a lot about and I, I teach a course called inbox manageable that to, that hacks back from that notion of you know the, the the zero utopia it doesn't exist but we can actually really um wrangle uh i guess the the or using technology to fight technology the the filters and the different ways that we um allow in certain information to enter our synapses you know we really want to protect that because we're, we're in massive overload we consume as much information in a day as somebody in shakespeare's time did in their entire yeah. life yeah. admittedly that life was you know much <laughs> shorter than ours but yeah yeah, it's, brains are, are are not designed for this much information, especially when we're not sleeping enough to actually recover some of our memory stores and, and process mm. it effectively. Yes, well, I won't share. I will share the fact that there's fifteen thousand nine hundred twenty nine emails in my inbox, always no. looking at me. You know, um, pro, you, you you get a lot of emails. Yeah. Oh my god. Uh, similar. I have I have one thousand thirty eight unread emails in my my um my inbox uh and recently i had to do a bit of a scrub of my computer because it was full and the culprit was email i deleted something like i tried to i tried to archive them but it didn't seem to free up any space on my computer so in the end i was just like you know what delete I just deleted a bunch of emails and as i was doing it, i was like hmm i wonder if i should really have done that because i may need to go back and uh you know uh, uh refer to something but then in the end i was just like no I, it's more important that i have space so bye-bye um but yeah i think that the whole team thing what i find i was thinking about this the other day is that um satisfaction at work is really highly correlated to how much you feel you're getting things done mm -hmm. and when your whole day is task switching that's that characterizes your your whole interface with work is it's basically you go to work for eight hours a day and you task switch there is it is not impossible to get any sense of that fulfillment so i think if we can eliminate that task switching bit then we'll be onto something and 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 i agree i mean um this is uh, this is a real bit this is a thing for me personally i have i really identify with um this questioner um and yes the overload is real um and the, the asynchronous nature of things like Teams messages or, you know, they're meant to be, um, you know, somebody messages you and then, you know, you reply when you see it. But the expectation is now that you reply straight away. So when you hear that ping or whatever, you're just like, oh, is that an emergency? Because there's no there's no triage of, of um, things coming in now. You don't know what's an emergency versus what's a teammate going, hey, how are you? Mm -hmm. So it's... Um, it's yeah it's really hard and i find that even on teams with the profile pics um you know you get that little dot uh in the in the on top of it that tells you if that person is busy or free or away from their computer nobody looks at that it? yeah. um so it's just kind of like <laughs> uh yeah the ping of emails is triggering for sure um <laughs> yeah there was a great there was a great 
was it a TikTok or a reel about that um, and somebody being triggered by the, the team's phone? Well, we, um, at our work, we have a, a member on our team called Alan. Yeah. And one night we spent way much longer, way longer than we should have done, uh, hacking into Alan's computer and changing the Slack notification to Alan, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> so every time he got a notification, you go, Alan, you know the BBC. Uh, yeah. Alan, 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 Alan. So That's the one. Steve, um, Steve. Everyone thought it was quite funny, apart from Alan, probably. <laughs> um, yeah. I, th I mean, the other thing, I mean, uh, I and a lot of my teammates have done for a while is it is to have a line at the bottom of your email signature that yep. basically says, I check my emails between blah and blah o'clock. So, you know, if it's super urgent, text me and I do this with my team too. It's like, I may not answer you straight away. If it's urgent, text me. Otherwise, um, you know, and when my team get my, my number to text me, I'm, I wouldn't give it out to the rest of the organisation. But, um, yeah, I think it's um, it's yeah, important to, to have that triage, Some create that for yourself some way so you know when something's important and something isn't. Yeah, um, uh, yeah and and as the, the question is saying, he feels like uh, or she feels like, um, um, I, I just can't turn everything off. I mean, you actually can, um, but you just need to explain the consequences or how you're going to manage that that turning it off with the people who are trying to get in touch with you, i.e. set the expectations of I will answer all of these messages between blah and blah. If it's super urgent, get in touch with me on this one particular channel. Otherwise, I'll just... I'll respond when I can yeah. because it's too much. And that deep work is so important, that focus time that you need to, to really get that satisfaction out of, you know, why we're doing this working, you know. So yeah. to the degree even that um, on the new iOS, if you have an iPhone, um, you can go into focus mode. So my, my um, phone will now send people a message saying, I'm in focus mode, I will look at this at this time. So, you know, those tools are there, even with using the important little thing in your um, email so that somebody then doesn't have to text you because I guess does that add to the overload of you checking lots of different channels? And that's what people say to me all the time is like, oh, my God, I'm, I'm checking like 17 different places. Um, how to, I'd love someone to design like a bucket, like a filter where you just check one place and it all dumps into the bucket. But apparently it's really hard, hard for APIs and stuff. That, that, I tried putting all my email into one place. Um, just ended up making look like I've got even more email. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Uh, um, one more thing about this too is that it's it's this is a this is about boundaries, right? Um, yeah. and we all have them in our life, in our personal lives, and you know they they definitely should be in that in your in your professional life as well. Um, so it's I think people are actually quite relieved when you draw one for yourself because it allows them to draw one as well mm -hmm. because no doubt everyone is suffering from this it's not mm -hmm. just the questioner me andy and and you as i'm sure as well jocelyn like mm -hmm. um it's not everyone is dealing with this yeah. um it so i think if you're able to, what's that sorry sorry it needs to come from the top down as well it needs to be yeah. modeled by directors and leaders because if you're getting an email from somebody at 11 o'clock at night that's sort of setting the standard for when you're when you're working or when you're not working and and those blurring of the blurring of those um work-life boundaries we all work at different times but there's there's something inherent being signaled when you have bosses or in my case it used to be principals messaging from their ipads at mm -hmm. 11 o'clock at night it doesn't set the best you know vision in your mind really <laughs> we're um we're actually just about to start work on a social contract um, which is something that agencies and clients can uh, sign together, which would have a whole bunch of things in it. But one of them is like, how are we going to work and what's the right way to kind of contact each other and when? Um, so that then people can take that and use that in their own relationships. So, um, yeah, more to more to come on that soon. Um, Prue, we've, we just sort of tipped on to boundaries then. Um, and this next question says, I keep getting told that we should push back on clients, but what if I do and they complain? What if my boss thinks I can't do my job? I can't afford to lose my job right now. Okay, there's a couple of things in this question. Um, I probably would want to know, uh, obviously this person is being told that they should push back on clients by somebody more senior. I, I would like to know why because, I mean, there are obviously situations in which, you know, that is 
entirely reasonable. So if the client's expecting too much or if they are pushing for a solution, like a um, particularly in design, if they're sort of coming to you and, and going, this is the way we want things, you know, we're, we're convinced that this is the way, can you just design this for us? Um, you know, the pushback there is obviously, yes, we should be um, we should be investigating this. Uh, we would approach this job another way, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, there is there are ways to push back. Um, oh yeah, but if it's if it's about um, with clients, yeah, just pushing back on them, like to to sort of um, manage them, I guess. Um, yes, that's also that sh- that should be done, but there are ways to do it. Obviously, um, the uh, pushing back, I think, is really about relationships. You need to be in a position that's really strong enough to to withstand um, truth telling, and this is what this is uh, is about. If I get the context of this right, is is um, pushing back to maintain boundaries yes um to say that request is unreasonable i will not allow my team to you know be working such unrealistic overtime blah 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 um uh, and i'm sure you would encourage your own teams to do the same so that relationship uh finding those um synergies between your organization their organization um there's a way to kind of always word it so that it's advantageous to everyone working on the project or the brief or whatever it is that you're working on um so yes clients i mean any client that's going to complain because you're pushing back with entirely realistic um and acceptable requests for respect, I guess, um, is not really a client that you want. And I think that the sort of age of the master-slave relationship is kind of hopefully drawing to a bit of a com- uh, close and then it is about fostering those long-term relationships. Um, the second part of the question sort of made me a bit sad because I, I can feel a sense of panic there in that what if my boss ca- thinks I can't do my job, I can't afford to lose my job right now. I don't think that that if, if it's your boss that's telling you you should be pushing back on clients, then you need to, and you don't feel comfortable going in and doing that, you need to ask your boss um, to give you support in doing that. It's like a, find out where the parameters are for your boss, like what is reasonable to push back on, what is not reasonable, and then, you know, just go by just go by what he or she says, you know, um, and feel justified in pushing back, knowing that your boss has told you it's okay but, um, within these parameters. Um, yeah, I don't know whether bosses would fire you over something, you know, if by over clients complaining if you, you know, reasonably explained the situation. Um, and if they did fire you over that, I think that's a bit harsh. Yeah, I mean, there, there is a lot going on in that in that question. I think mm. there's. There's a lot being talked about about pushing back on clients just generally in the industry and also, you know, in mental health presentations even that we've given recently, there's a um, there's there's often some elements of like the reason that you're pushing back is so that everyone can work to their best. Um, and that's really kind of often why you try and do it. Um, and I reckon, you know, also depending on what level this person's at, there's, you know, if you're the if, if there is a boss and they push back, it looks easy because there's a hierarchy thing going on and everyone kind of, you know, they'll go, oh yes, of course, that's fine. And so it is really hard to uh, grasp that, I think, as you're sort of coming through and up. Um, but I reckon there's a there's definitely an element there of like getting your boss to help you with this um, yeah. because that they will, they'll, they'll definitely be able to share oh, yeah. some experience, yeah. Asking junior staff to push back on clients really is hard. unfair. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Not, that's not on. Yeah. Um, Jocelyn, is there anything you want to add there around um, sort of perhaps boundaries? Yeah, I guess um, it's just all in the languaging, as Mm. as Prue has kind of talked about. Reframing expectations is really quite a different conversation compared to pushing back, you know, that notion of I am going to tell you you're being unreasonable Mm. Um, and just using really, uh, I guess, less emotive language to to talk about. And and I think uh, starting before, um, if you can, you know, before you set out working together so that there's like those clear expectations around, you know, what kind of hours are you meant to put in or what, where are the spiky bits of the project where you might 
you know, be, be working different ways. But, um, yeah, I think you've covered it. I think it's easy for people to defer to bosses and be like, oh, my gosh, I've got to, you know, worship and do absolutely everything they say rather than, again, when you start talking about boundaries, it sounds like bossy uh, yeah. as opposed to just, you know, being really clear about what you need. And, cool. Yeah. Okay. Jocelyn, this next question mm -hmm. is for you, but I think we'll yeah. all have a... Uh, a perspective on this so i think this is very much a uh, sign of the times so this question is how do i stop feeling like a cog in the machine and disheartened by the warming climate oh so this is a really interesting one because increasingly psychologists are studying eco-anxiety um and beyond just eco-anxiety which is um, defined by the World Health Organization even as a chronic fear of in, and the environmental cataclysm that comes from the perceived irrevocable impact of climate change. And I think what's really important there is the irrevocable nature, the irreversible nature, that sense of, oh, we've stuffed it and there's no going back. And obviously that feeling outside of our control is something that generates that anxiety. And for some people it even generates um I guess, massive anger. Um, and we want to, I guess, channel the anxiety and the anger into action and into something that's positive and meaningful. And those um, those actions, I guess, happen um, on lots of levels and every day from, you know, being able to put your, put your vote where it counts uh, to every single purchase that you make and, and having an environmental consideration under some of those things. So, uh, how do you stop being a cog in the wheel or the machine and disheartened? I think it's kind of reframing so that you have a sense of being able to take action, um, that there's some passive actions from being able to just, you know, donate to, um, you know, environmental causes that you don't actually have to do a lot of things through to the very, very active participatory uh, sort of things that you can do and just working out what you can, what you feel that you can invest, I guess. Mm -hmm would be my my advice um that's that, that's the old geography teacher in me coming out too I guess that you know understanding these issues is something that I spent the first part of my career doing um there's a lot around at the moment too about the greenwashing and some of these issues the idea mm. that you know many businesses are just waving the green flag when they actually have no freaking idea what they're doing but they know that it's really good to look sustainable mm. mm. Prue we were touching on this just before we came on and you'd found a, a yeah. book. I will put that um, in the link um, in the chat. But, um, yeah, I, I, I struggle with this too, um, the cog in the machine thing. Uh, I, I I like to sort of counter that that idea of being a cog in the machine with remembering the other side of that, is, which is kind of like, yeah, I am a cog in the machine. I am sort of like part of everything. You know, it's, it's going to sound very woo-woo, but, but we're all kind of part of the same consciousness, I guess. So if you're feeling like that, then other people are definitely feeling like that mm -hmm. and other people are definitely disheartened by the warming climate too, which is how we can possibly... Um, you know, uh, take some action because obviously taking action is the thing that uh, is going to, um, as soon as you take action on, on anything, you instantly feel better. Um, yeah, but I I just, I am wholeheartedly, uh, you know, disappointed by the approach um, that our current government is taking to climate and, you know, generally beyond, the, beyond that, you know, worldwide things just aren't moving fast enough. Um, but I'll put that, I, yes, I found this, I don't know, it's one of those um, uh, synchronicity things yesterday. I was, I just saw this book and I thought, I really want to read this. Um, it's called The Path Back to Connection in a Fractured World by Sarah Wilson. Um, and I'll just pop it in here. It just, it, it talks, <laughs> it talks about um, how, how we can sort of live to kind of hold those two things in our head at once yes everything's kind of fucked but um we can also find joy in the world um so yeah i'm, I'm gonna read that as soon as i possibly can because that sure. seems like a good thought to me 
Rebecca Huntley's book, How to Talk to People About Climate Change, is also a really <laughs> practical one so that you can have more regular discussions around the practical issues. So obviously climate change and climate emergency seems like a big scary thing. Again, that, that locus of control of like, well, it's not up to me what the IPCC does or I, whatever it's called, the International Interpanel of Climate Change, what they're doing, I can't influence that. But what can you influence? You know, those smaller steps, getting, you know, grassroots, all of that stuff, the, the bottom up as well as the trickle down. So I think that's a really good entry point as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's really complex. I've, I've just embarked on making sure that all of my stationery is, for instance, ecologically friendly because when you think about how many pens you go through, I'm a bit old school, I'm still writing things down, it's chronic um, and you can't actually buy decent eco pens, would you believe, in 2021? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, there's lots of good resources there um, and it's good to see that that book's already already on the list um, for someone as well. So that's that's good. Um, okay, Prue, back to you. This next question says, we've recently returned to a hybrid working model with a minimum requirement of two days in the office per week. The senior partners have presented this as a wholly positive move, but there are members of the team who are feeling anxious and stressed about returning to the office environment or commuting, commuting while COVID-19 is still prevalent. Uh, this person's in the UK, actually, but I think, you know, this is actually about to happen here in Australia, too. How should I raise this issue with them? And what alternative options could I suggest that might help any struggling colleagues? Mm, this is this is really topical. I mean, this is something that we haven't faced before, right, as yeah. a as a working collective. Um, we are grappling um, with this right now where I work. Um what does it look like moving forward? Uh, before we went into our sixth lockdown here in Melbourne, um, we we had a model where we were going in on uh, once a week on a Wednesday, um, purely to connect uh, as a team because obviously, and everyone would agree with this, the one thing that the pandemic robbed us of was that opportunity to connect socially um, with teammates and, and feel part of something. So... Um, yeah, we would probably look at two two days a week in the office as well, um, but with the same the same caveat. Like some people are just not um, comfortable with that, and we survey we surveyed we anonymous, anonymously surveyed our own people to sort of figure out what they feel comfortable with, and you can't discount those people that are um, fearful. Uh, uh, still, um, maybe they're immunocompromised, or you know, living with somebody who is, or have older parents, or whatever, and who can't be vaccinated. I mean, there, are, whatever the reasons are, those fears are real. So you have to, you have to really take them into account. Um, and I just th feel like any uh, decent organisation that you work for, if you share those those fears and those concerns openly in a very vulnerable way uh if they are not hearing you uh then i just can't see that that's a place anyone would want to work you know if they're not taking those fears seriously um so i i i would feel emboldened again this is you know that horrible word unprecedented times uh, uh so you know maybe unprecedented approaches are warranted um so I think, yeah, and the struggling colleagues thing is like, yeah, you, uh, it's yeah, obviously you you want to be be there with them and, and just validate the fact that those fears are real. So, um, yeah, yeah, I actually had a, a chat with someone recently in the UK who she told me how she was leaving her job because they were making them all go back into the office, mm -hmm. and she found her sweet spot at home, like life was good, work was good, um, and she left and found another job and actually just emailed me last week to say, oh, actually I'm going back. Um, so clearly the, the policy changed. Um, and so it's quite, it's quite interesting to see. I think also, you know, like this, you have to think this through, don't you? Like what does two days really look like? Cause actually it's like, who's, who does the two days and when, and how's it work on the projects and all like all of these types of things is actually, it's probably harder logistically for the business to do two days a week um, in the office than it is for everyone to just understand where they'll be and when by just all working from home, which is obviously what a lot of companies have recently come out and said is, like, you know, work from home forever. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, 
Jocelyn, anything to add on how mm. to perhaps have these conversations? I, I think this is really going to be huge. I have so many of my, my psychology clients talking to me about these issues and their anxiety mm. about being forced back is huge. Um, and there's also a lot of tokenistic, like, oh, yeah, we're happy to be flexible if you kind of go and get this massive wh report done about exactly why you need it. So a, a sense of still not being trusted. And I think mm -hmm. it is a two-way conversation between what the employee's concerns are, are if you stay at home that, you know, do we still have that sense that we're slacking off and we're not really going to work and we need to watch you? Um, I don't think that's as, as strong now, but really reframing the how we connect and what we need to be face-to-face -face for and, and getting bang for your buck almost out of those hours um, and, and rethinking the team's needs, whether, you know, we know digital connection isn't quite as good and it's great to get together, um, but can we revise, like, how we meet and why we meet and, you know, have a bit of a rule. If it's a meeting, it's got to have food. It's got to have an agenda. It's got to have outcomes. Mm -hmm. Are we going to follow up on stuff? Um, if we've all seen the memes, could this meeting have been an email? And it comes back mm -hmm. around to, like, why you guys have thousands of unread emails. Uh, so really revising, like you were saying, that that social contract, which extends to meetings, to when you show up, when you don't show up, um, listening to individuals and, and kind of noticing the individual nature of this stuff. Because if you live two hours away, then that commute, I think we've all kind of banked our commute time, hopefully, into our wellbeing bucket rather than just back into work bucket. And that's what people are really fearful of losing. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. I agree. I like the, the fearful of losing is definitely a thing. Um, one thing that's been on my mind lately is is could we be faced with a situation where, you know, we've all been working from home, but you know, once we hit, you know, almost the right vaccination rates, that the, there is a mandate to come back to the office because there's now no reason why you can't. Um, and maybe organisations have expensive real estate just sitting there, and and um, you know they need to justify that, and so that the call is come back to work um, with, the, this is like total nightmare scenario, the way that we have all been working during the pandemic, which is, you know, I, I think, well, in, in our case, we, we feel like we, we all feel like we've been working at least twice as hard um, despite being remote. Um, but the, then you go, you go back to the office, you continue working at that pace, you're on calls all day, every day, sitting next to a colleague who's talking to on another call somewhere else. It's a, a cacophony of voices. And then um, on top of that, you can have your commute back. Like mm. that would just be, I think there would be mutiny everywhere. Um, so, yeah, you're right. It's, it's like this is going to be a really big test case. It'll be so interesting to see what happens once those vaccination rates are where they should be. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, you, you know, you both mentioned that trust, it all comes down to trust here. And it's if those businesses end up, you know, forcing things back, um, then it feels like, you know, they haven't learned the lessons that we've experienced in in the pandemic and that how much trust can go to people to get stuff done. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, Prue, you summed it up as well. If maybe they're not, that's not the right place for you anymore. I think, yeah. you, you, you know, you can vote that way as well. Um, Jocelyn, final question from the ones that came in beforehand, and then we'll get into the questions that have come in live. Sure. Um, my housemate's mood has changed a lot recently. She's spending more and more time by herself. She never seems to be up for much fun. I've been following a lot of the mentally healthy work, but any tips on how to reach out to her? I don't want her to think I'm sticking my nose in. Yeah, another one that I've had a personal experience of maybe 10 years ago that um, mm. there's always that kind of sense of like, oh, I don't want to get in up you know, up in people's gills about how are you really, you know, even though we have campaigns all about asking people these questions. Mm -hmm. So, look, withdrawal is absolutely a significant sign of kind of mental distress, whether it's anxiety, whether it's depression. So we do definitely want to reach out. Um, the recommendation I make for having that conversation is to use a formula that Patria King from Quest for, for Life uses, which is the I notice, I imagine, and I feel prompt. So it might be something like, um, I noticed that you've been really withdrawn at the moment. You're kind of seeming a bit blue or down, however you might kind of sum that up. I imagine that things have been really tough lately or that, you know, the pandemic has been really difficult or you know, haven't been able to see your family. Again, your languaging of how you'd, you'd sum that up. And then put yourself kind of into that um, last bit, which is, 
I feel like I really wanted just to reach out and check in with you to see how things are going and if there's anything that we could do to support you. Okay. So I notice, sum up what you're seeing. I imagine, take that perspective. And then I feel, give them your perspective on what you're noticing and how you're seeing it. That's great. And don't give up, right? Like that's the other thing. Yeah. Is that there's times when you might, that, that person might not want to have a conversation, um, yeah. but there are other times when they'll give you just a little like mm -hmm. gateway into going, I might be ready for it now. And I remember when I did this with my flatmate um, way back when, he, when he came to moving out and the, the household folded or whatever, he said, I really appreciated that you stepped in because that gave me the kick up the bum that I kind of needed. Mm -hmm. And it actually started, you know, a bit of a, a change in his life where, yeah, it was, it was definitely worth having that conversation in the end. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, anything you want to add, Pro? Well, I'm definitely not a psychologist, but I absolutely love what Jocelyn just said about you know the 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 uh, the language. I think that's that's fantastic. I mean, yeah, that's it's kind of awkward, isn't it? That um, you know that line between am I am I prying? Am I um, you know sticking my nose in? As the questioner mm -hmm. says, um, which could make people retreat further if they don't feel close enough to you to have those conversations. But yeah, that casual language is really good. I like that. I'm going to use that too. Well, I just put in, I think that's, I, I wasn't, I didn't get to download the PDF, but there's something in the chat that mm -hmm. looks like it is what you said, Jocelyn. So. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So let's move to the, the questions that have come in. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'll come to uh, you, Prue, on this one. So I work at a digital marketing agency and I thought it was my dream job. They make us compete with one another and our work as designers feels undervalued. Comments like, we know you designers work late, haha. -ha. I feel stuck as I don't want to ditch my coworkers. Sounds like the Hunger Games. They make us compete with one another. Like, for what? Um, well, this is, I mean, in a creative agency and business, this is still quite the norm, certainly in some ad agencies I know, or even you know design agencies where you know, you sort of split off in teams and you've got to come up with answers to briefs. I guess there's there's competition in that kind of thing. I'm not sure whether it's exactly the same here, but mm. um, yeah, you're right. That does feel kind of hunger gamey, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Um, oh, um, I think this probably goes back to, uh, you know, comments like we know you designers work like, ha ha. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah there's probably a reason why they're working like this and usually it's because other people in the agency aren't doing their job and you're the less you're the last in the line the production line if you like um so you get the work late so you're there working late that generally um was my experience in that situation um but yeah uh, and yeah that obviously you, you don't want to ditch your co-workers um but yes the boundaries, this comes back to the boundary thing, doesn't it? Uh, it's about um, having those conversations and especially within the context of what's happening right now, um, you know, where people are, people's, you know, sometimes some people's are, gas tanks are empty and some are more full. It depends on your own personal situation and it's hard to know because we don't really know what's going on with people behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I... I think for me that's boundaries that we need so there needs to be conversations have you know and that person saying we know you designers work late ha ha that person needs to be put in their place uh mm -hmm. and explain to them why why that might be mm. um that's not a just a designer thing that's like a there's a culture thing i think happening here yeah. which is anyone who thinks it's okay to say that that's a and gets away with it as well i guess there's a culture that's sort of fueling that kind of mentality yeah, yeah. and the unfortunate thing about the competition thing is it really plays into the the kind of uh, mindset and predisp predisposition of many creative people uh, because we are always trying to, you know, um, and that's why people get so wounded when their work gets critiqued or you feel personally attacked when somebody is critiquing your work because we take it all so personally um, and we are so our self-image um, and our validation is very closely tied to the quality of our work and how it's received. So that that make, making us compete with one another could be a little bit, you want to ask yourself, is this a little bit self-perpetuating? Um, because it's so important for your work to be accepted. Uh, yeah, that's an that's an interesting one. Hmm. 
And without kicking off like a bit of a childish thing, you could be, if the, those kind of comments end up in Slack channels and stuff like that, you can be like, yeah, well, thank you for noticing how hard we we do work in order to support X, Y, and Z. I mean, you've got to be pretty confident to be able to pull some of that off um, and you don't mm -hmm. want to start a, a, a war, but, you know, really taking some of that and, and you know, it's that saying, do not feed the trolls, actually sometimes serve the trolls their shit back up to them <laughs> is, is my approach often. Yeah. So, yeah, depends on your style. I, th I think it also um, it touches on one of the questions that came up earlier around pushing back on clients because mm -hmm. I think you mentioned it there, Prue. Like it's, you, you may also have that same person might be a, I don't know whether they're a client manager, but it's very easy for them to take a brief, listen to the client saying it needs to be done tomorrow um, and then come back and, you know, put it onto the team. And suddenly it's not their problem, it's somebody else's problem. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, there's actually said so the same person has asked the next question, which is a colleague who isn't a creative puts designers down. And when I've said something, my boss has said, if I don't like it, leave. Um, I, I guess this is just a culture question, isn't it? Like it's, totally. that doesn't sound like anything is going to get better yeah. anytime soon. There. And good, loss, good luck to that boss if he thinks it's going to be easy to replace that person yeah. so easily in this market. Go mm -hmm. ahead try it it's very difficult to get great people right now the market is red hot um and talent is is you know <laughs> they will if they don't like something they will leave so yeah. don't call her or his bluff uh, yeah. i think it's uh yeah it's a bit dangerous right. isn't it yeah, and I think what happens then too is there's a whole bunch of refugees from places like that that start their own little WhatsApp groups talking about, you know, the people who have survived living of working at those places um, and there's, you know, an underground knowing that a particular place is not very cool to work at. Um, so, <laughs> that, you know, we've all heard about um, Googling people before they, um, uh, you know, we give them the jobs, but often employees are actually Googling employers and saying, okay, who's had a terrible experience working with, you know, X, Y, and Z. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, Jocelyn. Yeah. There's a, a question here, which is, do people get email PTSD? This is a really cool question. Um, possibly. So we know that sometimes people get what we would suggest is like email apnea, that idea that you hold your breath before kind of checking your email thinking, holy shit, what's what I'm about to come across? Especially when we're waiting for a reply, for instance, to the pitch that we've sent or whatever. Um, so I would call it maybe more email apnea. Uh, and yes, we're noticing that, that there is that overwhelm based on all those things that we talked about before. In terms of PTSD, some people are actually researching Searching social media PTSD because you can't actually control what other people are sharing. So uh, an example again that happened to me once was that just before bed I looked at my social media feed and somebody um, with really good intentions had shared um, some information about Syrian refugees and the death of a little kid. And just before bed, when I had a little kid that same age, really was massively triggering. Um, if I maybe looked at that first thing in the morning, it might not have had the same effect. So um, we do look at the fact that um, we, we can't necessarily control exactly what shows up and when, and we do need to kind of prepare ourselves for some of the, the things that get into our eyeballs when, when we're looking at screens, uh, especially those kind of collaborative social media spaces. So, yeah. Do you get email PTSD, Pro? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, it doesn't take much to give me PTSD uh, these days, and we probably shouldn't be so dismissive about it as a um, as a thing. But uh, I, yeah, I, I just, I, it, it. Some days it is really hard to uh, back to the, the previous question about being pinged all the time. It's like mm. it, you can feel your stress levels rising. Um, yeah, it's really important to. We, we all have to do something to manage that. That's that's going to be that's got to be top of the agenda for all yeah. of our mental health <laughs> um so there's one final question in here uh which did come in right at the beginning when we were we were talking about the boys club actually mm -hmm. um and so it's that i'm an art director and i also feel i miss out on roles at agencies due to being female so this is like a whole role thing um and so to kind of go back into that topic from earlier Peru, like what what's your thoughts on being a female coming into this 
industry now and feeling like you are being passed over? Well, this is interesting, and I'm probably going to reference the chat that you and I had the other day, Andy, but, um, yeah, I, I feel like there has been many strides ahead. There's certainly a lot of conversation about it, um, but whether or not it's actually being um, reflected in the real world at times, I do question that. Um, we were looking at a, a jury panel for some awards, international awards the other day, and we did that kind of scrolling thing of, um, you know, how many women are, and look, I think at about out of about 65 jurors, there were there were two females in there. Um, so that that um, sorry, no, that was the the. I, let, let me be fair. There was sorry, there was seven female judges out of um, 65 jurors, but there were on the website. It was just they hadn't put all the photos up clearly. But anyway. Um, Yes, it's hard not to be disheartened. I think the only thing you can do is just to keep keep going, keep calling it out when you see it not happening. Um, or when you, sorry, when I, when I said, I mean, when you see equality or equity not happening um, and obviously any egregious acts of, of sexism and all that kind of stuff or, or gendered decision-making, you really need to bring that out into the light. Um, it might be obvious to all your female colleagues, but your your male ones may not appreciate what you're going through. Um, yeah, so it's it's really just persistence. I would love to say that things are you know have completely changed or are changing rapidly. They're not, um, but we are seeing some change, which is really encouraging. And the only way to keep that going is to just keep um, women. I tell you, we are the most resilient, and uh, it really serves us well. Yes. I wonder, is there a way to do gender blind applications? Like, is there a way to kind of cut out this from, and I, I know it must be difficult when you're looking at people's CVs and probably work out what they've worked on, but are there some ways or even using technology so that you can submit portfolios and different answer different questions where there isn't it being connected exactly to who you are as a human and your gender? Um, yeah, I... I you know, that would be the only way sometimes I think that, that you could really know that, that that's not happening. And we see that even with with schools and universities, you know, when I when I mark um, first year uni essays, I, I don't necessarily know who I'm marking. So I don't have a sense of male, female, what kind of surname they have, where they might have originated from. So it really cuts that bias. Mm. Um, I've dropped in a few uh, resources. So we've worked on at Never Not Creative, we've worked on Never Not International Women's Day, which uh, was Prue and I and one of our friends, V. Um, and also um, there is a great movement happening at the moment to try and improve the misogyny in the industry, which is called fuckthecupcakes.com, which is actually where it. this T-shirt comes from because I'm on a committee at Fuck the Cupcakes to try and improve things uh, where I guess... There's a small group of us, but um, it, it perhaps is a little bit more comforting to know that there are men trying to um, address some of this because they are part of the problem and so they really do need to be involved in making um, better solutions. So uh, you can go and buy this T-shirt, in fact, at fuckthecupcakes.com. So uh, go, go take a look. There's one final question just quickly came in, so let's try and, um, let's try and address that one before we go. Any ideas on how to navigate imposter syndrome as a freelance designer when pitching to new clients? Um, pricing, displaying your value as a designer, etc. Why don't we try and tackle this uh, one each? So if Jocelyn, you want to talk about the, uh, maybe just a, a quick um, briefing around imposter syndrome mm. uh, to kick us off. Uh, so imposter syndrome is really that niggling doubt that you're not good enough. And I think 99.9% .9 of humans have that. Uh, so cognitive behavioural therapy is really helpful there just to talk back to those doubtful thoughts, to be able to catch yourself having it, check in, is it true, is it helpful, and then change it. So you might not be like the most shit hot person in the world, but what do you have to offer and really anchoring into your strengths. Um it, it kind of gets bended around a lot and there's some really great graphics. If you have a look at um, the new Happy on Instagram, uh, Stephanie there has a, quite a few fantastic graphics all about imposter syndrome that you think yourself think of yourself as much more separate um, and disconnected than you are from your colleagues. So finding that strength in the overlap helps us overcome imposter syndrome. 
that's a tweet length version. <laughs> also just added a um, interview I did recently with Blair Enns, who is kind of the guru on making sure that you get paid the maximum amount you can for the value that you provide. Mm -hmm. um, so go check that out. Um, and if you email me, um, I have a link to a video that I'm not allowed to share publicly, but I'll uh, share mm -hmm. with you. Uh, so just email me on that email address and I'll, um, I'll pass it on to you. Um, Pro, I know you exhibit imposter syndrome every now and again. Oh, yeah, it's impo <laughs> It's so infuriating. You'd think that, you know, after all this time, um, I'd be the opposite. And, I, and I, I, I say that without any kind of shame or anything like that because I think it just normalises it for everyone. It doesn't matter how long you've been around. You don't get to some magical um, milestone and just go, that's it, you know, like I... I, I, I um, it, the, the imposter syndrome stays with you, and I think it probably is portable to other other careers as well. Like I, it's not just limited to um, creative people, but we're probably a bit more susceptible. Um, yeah, I. Sorry, the question part of that, Andy, you wanted me to address the um, more practical. I guess the value and the pricing. Yeah. Okay. There's there's an amazing. Um, oh well. I'm sure that a lot of you probably know about this guy. And if you don't, you could probably follow him on Instagram. Um, his handle is, I'll put it in the chat, at the Chris Doe. Um, and he is um, really, uh, really great at this stuff, at asking for what you're worth um, and and give some very practical advice and tips on that. And he bas his, his ideas are basically that never, ever kind of cheapen your work to, to get work from cheap clients because if the if the person's kind of saying the first thing they're asking you is how much is this going to cost they're not really um they're not really interested in doing good work they, they just want they just you know and then you send them off to fiverr or 99 designs or whatever so um yeah a lot of his content is excellent um particularly for people who are on their own or have their own agencies or freelancing so i would encourage you to look at what he says yeah, I think um, Blair is actually on the board of Christo's company. Mm. So you've got two very good uh, resources to go and check out there if you if you haven't heard of them already. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, that's all we have time for today. Um, Jocelyn and Prue, thanks so much for joining us. Prue, great to have you back as always. And um, Jocelyn, you know, it's, it's it's great actually to have someone with such amazing perspective on technology on the psychology side. That's been fantastic. So we'd love to love to have you back Thank is my you. early pitch. I will try and get my bloody camera working next time so you can actually see I'm a real, <laughs> real living, breathing human. Somebody on <laughs> Instagram told me yesterday that they thought I was actually an AI bot. So oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's, <laughs> we're, at that, we're at that funny grey point. It's like, is that a compliment or, or not? <laughs> Technology. Oh, I really want to hear more about surveillance capitalism. Can, can, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Surveillance capitalism and the attention economy. Mm -hmm. And here's another one for you. Um, uh, internalised capitalism. Ooh. Go and Google that one. We could talk for hours. Okay, great. Wow. Okay, I'm going to just quickly put a link into the surveillance capitalism. Um, there's a link to The Guardian, which I think then references the book. Um, she's, she's, oh, I can't, I'm never going to be able to say her name. Shoshana Zuboff. She is in, if you've watched The Social Dilemma, um, she's one of the uh, people right. who did get included in that. Many voices obviously were cut yeah. from that. Um, and, you know, we can even talk about how one-sided that documentary was uh, another time. But she, she, if you want to you know, see her stuff, she talks about it there. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone for joining us as well. This uh, is recorded, so it will go up on the site um, at nevernotcreative.org soon. And uh, we'll be back on the first Thursday of next month. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. That was fun. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye.